Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today. This is webinar number 30 in a series of webinars for small business navigating the impacts of COVID-19. I'm Barbara Coffey, Director of Economic Initiatives for the City of Tucson. Today, we will talk with Pima County officials for updates and programs as we head into winter with this pandemic. As always, we will take your questions as we go, so feel free to enter those in the chat box or in the Q&A function, and we'll get to as many of those as possible in our time together. We will keep all participants muted since we have a large number of attendees, but we do record the session and we'll make it available for everyone tomorrow. You can find links to all previous webinars at connecttucson.com, and typically we'll have this webinar there by noon tomorrow. So let's get started. First up, Dr. Terry Cullen. She's a family physician who retired from the US Public Health Service as Rear Admiral in 2012 after leading multiple software development and deployment initiatives within the Indian Health Service. Under her leadership there as CIO, she rolled out what was the only certified health information technology system within the federal government. Between 2012 and 2015, Dr. Cullen worked as the Chief Medical Information Officer for the Veterans Health Administration. She worked to develop a new model for community involvement in health information technology and expanded work in multiple domains, including interoperability, data sharing, standards and terminology, and informatics patient safety. As an expert in population health IT software and with a keen ability to utilize technology to meet identified cl clinical needs, her role as the current health director of Pima County couldn't come at a better time. So with that, Dr. Cullen, I'll turn it over to you to get us started this afternoon. Welcome Great. and thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining. Thank you. I am gonna, hopefully you guys, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Let's go to the slideshow. Um, I, ha I have about 20 slides that I'm going to go through with you. And then we'll obviously be able to answer questions once I'm done. Diane is going to talk. Don Gates is on also, who is um, uh, helps our business planning at the health department. And Lonnie Anderson will also be on. And you're probably familiar with Lonnie as the head of chefs. Um, consumer food health and safety. But what I'm going to do today is really give you an update of where we are with COVID-19 because everything I say is within the milieu of what is happening with the pandemic. And I do not have this slide. Sorry, I'm looking for my note, for my, <laughs> my latest graph. This is not a slide, but I want to share it with you. Um, at the height of our pandemic in June 28th to July 4th, we had 2,452 cases of COVID. Last week, and we do this thing called MMWR weeks, they're Sunday to Saturday weeks, they're CDC defined weeks, and we do that just so we can compare each other. Week 49, that was 1129 to 125, and we know this number is not complete. It will continue to go up. We had 4,253 cases. So we have had the highest number of cases we've ever had in a week, the highest number of cases we've ever reported in a day, the highest number of hospitalizations. So we are in a very, very accelerated phase of the pandemic. And that's just important to understand as we go through what's going on with the impacts of COVID-19. This is our dashboard. Um, hopefully you guys have seen that. It started at really as a back to business dashboard. We also use it for our school criteria. If you paid any attention to it back in May or June, and that may seem so far away you don't remember, you may recall that the di disease criteria were different. The disease criteria were then modified to be consistent with the state because the state used this for business reopening and for school reopening. So we thought, well, let's just be consistent with the state, which is what we were able to do. So what you see here, is our disease criteria. Uh, two of the three are red and one is yellow. That percent positivity just went 
read last week. These are uh, updated on Thursday. They're two weeks old. It, it gets a little complicated, but suffice it to say, there's a delay in the update here, but we are now read. What that means because of this two week delay is the odds of our getting out of the red anytime in the next three, four or five, six weeks are very minimal in my opinion. So the odds are we will stay in the red. Our healthcare capacity criteria, as you know, or may not know, but we did just expand lab testing. We added 270 tests a day. We're adding a little more with the ASU saliva test, uh, adding another hour. Um, but what's significant here is our hospital bed capacity. There, were, there was a day last week we had one ICU bed in the county. Now, that does not mean people don't get care. People are transferred to other places. Maricopa has continued to have bed availability, but it does say the extent of the enormous strain that we are seeing within our county. Our PPE is adequate. We ask for our emergency responders to have up to two months of PPE. We know that we're, they're going through that quite rapidly, but we believe we'll be able to maintain that supply so we can stay in the yellow public health capacity, timely case investigation. As you can imagine, when there are 1,200 cases a day, it's very difficult for us, despite having elasticity and resiliency in the system, to be able to get to all of them within 48 hours. So that has been read. We were very, very close to going to the yellow, but now we're probably going to stay in the red for a little. Just so you know, we do call every case. It's the timing on it, and we have backup from the state that we're incredibly grateful for. Uh, so this is just the definitions of what these are, and we will um, give you this slide, so I'm not going to spend any time on that. I want to go to the state business reopening guidance. You may recall this. This was developed by the state. It's comparable to the schools. There's a little difference in the schools in terms of positivity, but you can see minimal, moderate, and substantial spread here. Remember, these are the three disease criteria that we talked about. This is where we are by county. Um, I'm hopeful that most of you have been to this website. Once again, this is the website that's updated. For us, it's updated Wednesday night. It's released to the public Thursday morning. You can see what's happening here. You have cases per 100,000, 246 one week, 350 the next week, and you can see November 15th. That's the delay we were talking about in terms of data being updated. Percent positivity, you see 8.9% going to 11.1%, and then CLI, which is the hospital visits for COVID-like illnesses. The percent positivity will, the way one of these factors gets in the red is you have to have two weeks in in the red. Percent positivity will remain red then for the next reporting period here. So the next time this comes up, we will have red in cases, red in positivity like we have on our dashboard, and COVID-like illness will stay yellow. COVID-like illness has never been at 10%, even in the height of the pandemic before. So uh, as I say to people, if we hit 10% with COVID-like illness, we are really in a very accelerated phase. So I would remind you that this is an important dashboard. You can go to it, you can get to it from the Pima County dashboard. If you're interested, just you can type in Pima County Health Department COVID-19 dashboards and you'll be able to get the one I previously showed you and as well as this one. These are the business benchmarks and you can see these for the different counties. What's important to note is everyone is in moderate transmission, but remember that's because they have to have two or more in red, three or more in red to move along. So uh, we have moderate community transmission. I define us as accelerated community transmission. Remind you of that number for over 4,200 cases in one week. That is a seven day period. So it's over um, 650 cases a day. Very, very significant transmission. I, I wanna just recollect for you, there was a time when we had 250 cases a week and we thought that was a lot. So now we have four, over four, 4,200 a week. 
So just to give you some sense of the comparison. So the state guidance and executive orders, these will all be linked to this website when you get it, the, the URL. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see all these businesses uh, and guidance that the, uh, the governor has promulgated. But let's talk about the local COVID-19 regulations. And you can see here the back to business, back to business steering committee, you're probably aware that met a few times, really allow business to participate with the county. We did something similar with schools. We did something similar from a public health perspective. So back to business was really the umbrella and under that were these different um, committees. And you can see here, we developed these COVID-19 minimal health standards for businesses. And this was the proclamation. And once again, you can find but bit guidance for this on the website. And the real goal of this was for us to help businesses make the best decisions in terms of what we call layered mitigation, what they were going to do. We've seen this with the schools. And so we know that this is a really positive approach to trying to ensure that health standards that are being used can help mitigate the spread of COVID. And then we have these temporary, these temporary health standards, operating guidance. It was never the county's attempt to really punish businesses. It was really education. We wanted to work really closely with businesses, very similar to the approach that uh, consumer food health safety had taken over the years, which was let's just get everybody to the safest place we can get in terms of dealing with businesses. So then we get um, a revision of this. And this was just resolve, uh, revised on Friday at the last Board of Supervisors meeting. And so we wanted to bring this up with you so that you are aware. This strengthens the enforcement of the temporary COVID-19 minimal health standards. Now, I would remind you that the reason why this was proposed was due to this accelerated transmission of COVID-19 that we were seeing. So right now there, uh, and this was consistent with the governor's proclamation also that there's a warning and then there's a second violation, which is an enforcement action, which may include closure of the establishment. We are, and I'm pretty sure Lonnie will join, but we're in the process of evaluating what does that mean? Uh, I would say this just happened on Friday. And so we're trying to ensure that we understand the specifics of this. I'm probably not able to answer very specific questions about this, like if this, then this, because we are dependent upon some additional interpretation of what this guidance means. Then we have Pima County Resolution 2020-96. You have heard of this, which is the face covering proclamation resolution. There's lots of exemptions for there. They are all driven medically. So the point is to ensure that people that need to have a medical uh, option have that available to them. But it is important that people wear face coverings. There is a MMWR uh, CDC puts out MMWR morbidity and mortality weekly reports um, approximately a week ago, and we can make sure we send this, Barbara, to you. There was a review of the state of Kansas looking at where people masked in different counties and comparing the transmission of the disease. I'm asked multiple times for scientific data on this. I think that is the best one I have because it's county based at a state level um, where counties made different decisions about masking and we can share with you the impact that we know masking has. Uh, obviously there have been lots of dialogue around masking, but you can see here that revisions were made and you can see the revisions which are in the last bullet here. Um, must refuse and must request. Let me go back, sorry about that. Okay. Then revision, other revisions here, it strengthens enforcement. There is a violation with a civil infraction. There's a violation for the specific business here. And the way this will be done is based on complaints. There are not people going out looking for people that are violating, as you are aware, the 
our business component of the health department has focused on mask wearing and compliance with that when people have shared complaints with us and then there is an investigation with them. So the only way this is gonna happen is if people share a complaint and that is available on the website. So uh, then in terms of the impact on small businesses, there is this mandatory curfew. This is from the city. We just wanted to bring this up with you. I'm sure you're aware of it. We did a voluntary curfew and we did that voluntary curfew thinking that it would be consistent with what we saw at the university when we were able to minimize transmission of COVID-19 with a voluntary shelter in place. That was designed for a very specific census tract areas where we were seeing uh, an increase in what we call the R naught. R naught is how quick, how many people the virus will infect. It's kind of an odd concept, but ideally what you want is less than one person to get infected by the virus if you have it. Um, what, when we see an R naught above one, what that means is that more than one person can be infected from the, the case themselves. Now recall, we have had days where we have had 1,200 cases. So if each of those people affect one person, then we would have another 1,200 cases. If they each affect two people, then we would have 2,400 more people impacted. So our goal is to really make sure that we can control that or not. The point of the curfew, as you can see here, was really to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Um, the city has imposed a mandatory curfew at the meeting on Friday. The, the Board of Supervisors indicated that they would monitor what is happening within the city. There is still a voluntary curfew recommended for the county, but in terms of the impact of it, we will be working with the city to look at what happens there. So let's now talk about the Pima Ready For You program. That kind of gives you the update of where we are from uh, proclamations, from resolutions, from work that's been done. And hopefully you can see why the county, uh, the Pima County Health Department, I'll, I'll just claim my part in this, has wanted to add some additional layered mitigation to what we are seeing in the county in terms of transmission of the disease. So the Ready For You program, I'm, I, my guess is most of you are aware of it. A thousand, over a thousand facilities have participated. People apply to get this badge. Uh, there's a virtual inspection completed by a consumer health and food safety representative. Um, and then people are given the badge and this Ready For You that can go on to their business. The business assessment and tools then include um, the, the things we offer to help businesses is the CDC Resuming Business Toolkit. This is what many people have followed that have looked to get the badge because the badge is there's guidance on what you need to do to get the badge. But the real point of that, once again, is from a public health perspective that we mitigate and minimize the issues, uh, the possibility of transmission of the COVID virus. This link, which once again, you'll have when we send the slides out, can really help you lower the impact of possible transmission in your workplace. Uh, we will tell you, as you know, that guidance has changed over the last nine months. And I just think it's important that people recognize that. We've had guidance that um, you didn't need to wear masks early on, remember? optional masks. That was when we thought there was droplet transmission. We now know there's respiratory transmission, which means my breathing itself can transmit the virus. We know 50% of people that have the virus, up to 50% can be asymptomatic. So the sniffle they had yesterday, they just thought that was a sniffle or the headache they had, they just thought, oh, I'm, I'm stressed, so I have a headache. They may be signs of COVID. So the whole point of doing it is 
of implementing layered mitigation is to decrease the risk of transmission, not only to customers, but also to staff and employees. Because we know, for instance, that many of our long-term care centers who end up having outbreaks, the outbreaks are not happening between one long-term care resident and another long-term care resident. They're not starting it. It's their staff that is coming in from outside that is starting it. That's why in those cases, we do very active testing and transmission there. So health department resources and support. Um, we actually hope that we are a resource to people. We know that we can help people get through this process. We have consultations available. We've been doing these since, um, since May. So for almost uh, seven months, we've been doing consultations. A lot of those early consultations were from small business owners that just wanted to know, hey, what can I do? Or two of my staff are out, what should I do? I think we've become more sophisticated, businesses have become more sophisticated, and now we really have more design checklists to help a business go through and see what they need to do. Specifically, we have referrals that come to us for testing. We wanna make sure that we do have testing available. You're probably aware we have our downtown pop-up site on a pretty regular basis where anybody can go to that. All of our testing is once again available on the PMA County Health Department website. You just search Pima County Health Department testing. Most of the testing does have availability within 24 hours. We had a period around Thanksgiving where that was decreased because one of our labs gave people vacation for two days, but we're pretty much caught up with that backlog here. We do have complaint response as we've talked about previously, um, and we also provide PPE, especially to small businesses. Our goal is to make sure that you have the tools as a small business to mitigate PPE transmission that you know when to use those tools, like when is the appropriate time for you to use specific parts of PPE as you move along. Um, the other thing, it, this talks a little bit about our business technical assistance. We have liaisons that answer all inquiries. We uh, have people available, and as many of you know, at nights on weekends, we go out and do night and weekend inspections. We work closely with the workplace environmental assessments to make sure that what's going on with the food assessments is consistent with what we need for COVID-19. We use most of the food assessments right now to also do a secondary COVID-19 assessment to make sure that we can not only give people guidance specific to food safety, but also for COVID-19. You know COVID-19 is not transmitted in food. There is, it's definitely transmitted in what we call fomites. So cleaning surfaces is really an important part of the three W's. Wash your hands, wear a mask, wait. Though uh, last week I did a webinar for the VA and one of the veterans said, oh, it's not weight, it's wingspan. So put your arms out so you get the six feet. So I've taken my last W, I'm now gonna have meet wingspan. But this is all really important stuff. And then stay home if you are sick. Now we are aware that that is very difficult, especially for frontline workers um, who are wage earners. So we recognize that there is an impact, an economic impact. Uh, we recognize that there's an economic impact from all of this, but we are, sensitive to the wage earners when we talk with them if they are a contact or a case. And we do have care management resources available when we reach out to people that have been identified as contacts. Um, and now the last part of this is this mandatory reporting uh, that came up at the Board of Supervisors meeting. The reason why this came up is related to what we've been able to see with the schools. You may be aware that we have made a commitment to keep the schools open and we've made that commitment it changes day to day, but we've been really stable with it because we know what cases are in the schools and we're able to go out and do almost immediate case investigation, contact tracing, and stop outbreaks. Our goal with this mandatory reporting is not to share a name with anyone. It's not, it's not to let other people know about it. It's so that we have early awareness of where there are cases and that we can come in and offer guidance and services and testing if needed. So the whole point of this is to keep business open. It's not to close anyone. It's to make sure that we 
can offer you the services that as a health department we should be offering, which remember are prevention and care. And so the point of this is to make sure we can do that. I will tell you this is not set up yet. It, you cannot go somewhere and give me the name of your business that uh, may have had a case. We hope to have that set up at the end of this week. We are leveraging the work we've done with the schools. Um, and we believe, not that this is the schools, but we'll be able to leverage the technology that we developed for the schools to have this reported also. Um, mitigation plan review, this is layered mitigation. Uh, this is what we also do from a, uh, the Pima County Health Department. And finally, um, business maintaining healthy operations. And this is kind of where we end up. This is all this information. I'm sure you've seen this, this is from the Arizona Department of Health Services and we're able to give you any more information and guidance. So um, I'm gonna close by reminding you, we are in a pandemic. We have never been in a pandemic before. We are learning as we go along. I am scared, to be frank. I, I need to put that out there. I was talking, to, I talked to the hospital, I'm a physician, I talked to the hospitals pretty regularly. All of us are worried that at some point we may run out of capacity now because we're, we reside in a state that has more capacity in the Phoenix area, we will probably be okay. But this accelerated transmission that we are seeing right now in December, we have not seen before with this pandemic. Many people predicted we would see this in the fall, in the winter. We are not seeing influenza we are seeing COVID, there is some influenza out there, but the wear, wash, wait, wing sprint, wingspan, whichever one you want there is critical. It's critical for you everywhere. And you may have seen the new CDC guidance that just came out, wear a mask and wear a mask when you are not with people that you live with. So any other situation, I would just encourage you to wear a mask. And with that, I am gonna get out and turn it over to Diane. Great, thank you, Dr. Cullen. I'm gonna throw a couple questions to you that before we, before we move on. Um, Jane asked, is the COVID Watch app still working? So are you familiar? Yeah, the COVID Watch app is from the university and it is still working. Um, they actually are just releasing some new data. You know, it hasn't been as successful as they thought it would be, but um, that's probably primarily because the vast majority of people that are part of it are um, university students and what they need is the community to be part of it. So there was a, another question. This one might be a little tougher for you, but Jerry asked, is Pima County going to lower property taxes due to negative impact that the restrictions have on property values and income? That is beyond me. <laughs> Maybe Diane wants to take that, but I don't know if anyone wants to touch that one. Right. I know, but I thought I have to do my part. I have to ask it, put it out there. And I appreciate Jerry uh, being part of our audience today. And I know we're all concerned, right? We just don't even know um, what the total impacts of this pandemic will be because we're not through it yet. As you just shared, um, the severity is real. And um, I do want to say I, I enjoyed uh, some of the pop-up testing convenience myself. I did uh, test at the Tucson International Airport. So I throw that out that if you do travel or if you're coming in or out, or if you're just close by there, that was very convenient. Um, and, uh, and appreciated the quick turnaround now that they do have the 20, the 48 hours right now for tests. And so that's fantastic. Cause I remember when it used to be about five days before we were getting results early on. So um, is there, that, that's my question to you as well, Dr. Cullen, how often, we know people ask, how often should they be testing and, and is it testing for just when you are symptomatic or, you know, what's your answer to that? So it's a, it's a great question and there's no great answer. So let me tell you the guidance we give people. Um, many people test or are asymptomatic and have no known exposure. So you should theoretically not need to test if you've had no known contact, no known symptoms, but people test because they're worried or people test, we, we know there are employers that encourage people to test regardless. So our, 
our approach with the availability of the testing is to make it as simple and as easy for anyone to come in that wants it. You may recall early on that you could not get a test unless you had symptoms and the CDC approved you. Do you guys remember that? Like I was still working in the ER at TMC at that point. Um, so nobody got a test, which was, which was terrible. We have made that ubiquitous because we believe that that's important, but who should test? If you are symptomatic, and I will tell you, a sniffle can be a symptom. I don't want you all to get scared, but the, the symptoms are pretty vague. You can have GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea can be symptoms of COVID, even though we don't think of it that way. Um, and in addition, if you are a contact, so if you've been around somebody that has known COVID, hopefully we will contact you and you will know to test. Now in that situation, you should test day five or six. So whenever you were <coughs> a part of the content, whenever you were with the, con the case, five or six days later, you should test. We actually put pop-up testing at the airport because we thought it was really important. We wanted people that were flying in to have the opportunity to test. We are testing a significant amount of, of people there. It's fascinating to me how people don't remember where they flew from or what their flight number was, um, but that does happen. We know that they have a bag with a tag, uh, mm -hmm. but we don't try to figure that out. And the reason for that is that one reason we want to know if you're if you end up being positive we would like to be able to alert um, the airline I, that doesn't mean we give them your name but it may be helpful for other people um, yeah so, <laughs> cool. so testing is pair depends <laughs> on what you're trying to do with it I think but if you're sick please go test but also stay home well, and I know it makes it tough, those that suffer from allergies, let's say, and we know we've had like high winds lately and, and sort of air quality issues. And I, I do think the sniffle is concerning, right? I think we're all, we're going to be sensitive to that, but you gave us some other good advice. Um, in particular, one other thing from your slideshow, you mentioned um, PPE for businesses. What, can you give me some examples of some things that you might still have available for businesses should they need to reach out for, for those things? Um, we have masks, we have gloves, we have sanitizer. We can give people guidance in terms of cleaning supplies. I don't know that we have a lot of cleaning supplies, but we give people guidance on what they should be using. But those things are all, all available primarily for small businesses and that's what they're designed for. And the website, and, and I don't think I put that in there, but we'll make sure we get you that website so people will know where they can um, reach out and get that information. That's great. That's great. And you can put anything you'd like to share, links and information in the chat uh, and everyone who's online should be able to see that. Um, so I'll keep us moving. Next, I'll introduce Diane Frisch, Pima County Director of Attractions and Tourism since May 2017. She leads the county department in managing the many attractions uh, throughout the county, the leases of county properties, including the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, Colossal Cave Mountain Park, Pima Air and Space Museum, and Pima County Fairgrounds. She's leading the county efforts for a new contract for Old Tucson as well. Her team recently opened the Southern Arizona Heritage and Visitor Center in the historic courthouse. She works closely with Visit Tucson to market and promote the region's amenities and quality of life to visitors and residents. Currently, Diane spends much of her time working to safely reopen area attractions given the pandemic requirements under the Ready for You program. You may not know that Diane began her career in broadcasting and served as vice president and general manager of both radio and TV stations in Idaho, California, and Arizona. Arizona. Her emphasis was in sports marketing with NFL, NHL, Major League Baseball, and event management. Prior to coming to the county, she worked for the PGA Tour and PGA Tour champions in multiple markets as a sales and marketing manager. I always like to throw in, that's little known facts maybe for some, but, but uh, really brings some expertise to her role in attractions. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Diane. I'd love to uh, hear how things have been going. I know we, we started uh, when we first talked about this webinar about uh, large scale events and what would be happening over, um, uh, even as we uh, planned for this a few weeks and months ago. But um, why don't you give us your perspective on how things have been and then where we're headed? And feel free to share your screen and don't forget to unmute yourself. And I'm going to watch for questions. All right. 
There we go. And we'll get my slides up here. Thank you so much. Man, having to follow Dr. Cullen is something else. But um, yes, we're, I guess the, the basic part to start for everybody that's in attractions and tourism hospitality is, wow, um, we, we didn't plan for this. We've never seen anything like this. It is something else. So just to give a little uh, base from where we started, the Federal CARES Act, the money that's coming from the feds to help us battle this, we've pumped about 40 billion into the economy here in Arizona. That includes PPE, assistance, um, loans, uh, PPP, PPE, all those kinds of things. Um, we've seen some job gains coming back since March, but at the peak, it was over 13% and about 25,000 jobs within Pima County. Statewide, looking at all the jobs, about two thirds of the jobs uh, that we've lost, that's about 100,000 jobs that need to get back to where we, we can get back to our reemployment level. So if the state would add just a few pencil it out, 14,000 jobs per month between now and June, we could recover it. Um, obviously, the longer the pandemic goes on, the deeper it is, the more consumer confidence that's not there, the longer it's going to take us to, to get back. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while for us to, to get back where we want to be. Um, let me share with you. By the numbers, Pima County, now these are numbers that were released in June 2020. So if you look at overall um, tourism in Pima County or in the entire state, we're looking at about 2.6 billion in direct travel spending in Pima County, about 25,000 jobs. Um, Tax-wise on tax receipts, that is, is about just almost $81 million. If we look at one of this, the benchmarks we take, it's Metro Tucson housing, 46% from July to September. So people are traveling, um, their confidence is down. We've seen layoffs and furloughs in the tourism industry, but also in the attractions industry, particularly those that are ticketed events and they, they make their numbers uh, based on high attendance. We just can't do it these days. Um, you just can't have a large group of people um, in one location due to the spread. And I'll tell you at first, being a, a tourist and, a, and an attraction sports person, we were advocating, let's get them back open. We'll just do a good cleaning. Everything will be fine. And the more you you talk to the health professionals and particularly Dr. Cullen and Dr. Garcia, we've had some long conversations understanding what's at stake here um, and how we get back. And so we don't get on that roller coaster where our numbers go down, then we open everything up, then the numbers go down, then we open everything up. That's not what we want and it's not a long-term solution. Right now, the other thing that's adding into some of our stress is the borders are closed. Both Canada and Mexico are closed at this time. We don't see them opening until sometime in first quarter. Um, restaurants, our local restaurants, which are a huge source of pride and revenue for us here locally with the gastronomy rating that we have, um, they're suffering. But at the same time, it's, it's difficult to open them up. So we've done things in Pima County like extend the outdoor areas, um, open restaurants for takeout. Uh, some people say to me, oh, your attractions and tourism, you, you guys must be just be sitting in the office twiddling your, your thumbs because there's nothing to do. I said, we've, we've never been busier. Um, our staff is taking on some additional duties within the county. Part of those, the Ready For You program, we extended that into attractions and restaurants, um, anything that would be a ticketed event, not only to help with the education that we have from the health department, but 
to also, again, go back to consumer confidence. We have people call and say, gosh, we were thinking about going to this uh, attraction. Do you think it'll be safe? Are my kids okay? What's their masking policy? What if it's outdoors? Is that better? What do, what do I have to do? Can I take water? I don't want to buy water there. Can I take my own water? So just helping people go through that, supplying masks and cleaning, all those things that we can do. Um, we did retrofitting of some of the county facilities. So we had touchless water fountains, touchless doors, um, all those kinds of things that we could retrofit and take for them. We are also working quite a bit with our partner, our DMO Visit Tucson. We applied for and received a grant for them of a half a million dollars where they're using their money to market in drive markets. We do see some people in drive markets coming. So Maricopa County, people will come down for maybe the day, the weekend, um, we're extending the Ready For You program to make sure that resorts and hotels, again, have that signage and have gone through the program so people feel comfortable and that's important to us. So those are some of the things we've been working on. Pima Eats is another um, Facebook site that we've done and I'm sure a lot of you have seen it where the restaurants need, again, more support and help that yes, it, food is safe it's safe to go in and pick up food. So Pima Eats is a task that our department has taken on. Um, Catherine Strickland is leading those efforts where every day she's posting updates of restaurants and food and hours and takeout and um, some of the local sites where maybe it's a restaurant on your side of town that you've never used. So she continues to update and put that information on um, quite a bit on Instagram and on Facebook, and that that really helps. Um, let's go to the next slide. I didn't, if Diane, I can't see your slides. I didn't know if you were sharing, wanting to share those with us, but. I do, let me make sure I thought I was sharing. But love to see those numbers. And it's, um, it's certainly interesting. I watched how some of our large events like All Souls Procession, you know, went through their, um, their event. They created some hybrid version. And I wondered if you had any comments about how some of those kinds of things adapted uh, this year and, and any feedback from, from those experiences on the part of the organizers or attendees. What do you think? Sure, can everybody see my screen now? Is that a little better? Yes, that's, that's perfect. Okay, um, we did, that was one of the first things we did was begin to work with some of the events that were happening here in Pima County. So we worked with um, Tucson Meet Yourself mm -hmm. and we said really we, we just can't, there's no way we can do a large scale event like that, but how can we reimagine it? Um, and they were really creative in doing smaller events throughout town over multiple weekends, transitioning some of what would have been live events into smaller events. Um, and so there, there are a lot of discussions going on now with people, large scale events, how might we reimagine them? Um, for some of the grants we did for the outside agencies that are, are usually a large scale event and they weren't able to do those, we went ahead and said, well, can you, what, in this time of Zoom and when school children are looking and teachers and school districts for additional information, can you do some things online that would provide um, information or free lectures or classes? And they've been able to transition and do that. So it's really been a learning process, but we're helping them with the tools and how they might do that. And again, promoting them online to people. So if you wanna take um, a reading class with your students, Tucson uh, Children's Museum of Art is, is doing reading. Our libraries are doing reading classes. They're doing lectures. Um, it's, it's really a way to transition. Is it easy? Not always, but once you get your staff and your volunteers into it, we find it works. 
Um, the other challenge that all of us are having, I think, for attractions and tourism is volunteers are a huge base for us. And volunteers right now don't feel comfortable. Um, they're not ready to come back. So how do you run your business without a large volunteer docent um, staff? And so again, we work on how do we transition that to moving some things online, to working with a smaller staff, to be more selective in, you can't be all things to all people right now during the pandemic, but what can you do? Mm -hmm. um, some of the events have moved into first and second quarter of next year. We can't stop things, but they want to at least be planning. Mm -hmm. And so they are planning things with the caveat that it's gonna be a day by day um, change as we move forward. So yes, we're planning some things in first quarter, um, every day when we get those new numbers and we're working with the health department and we're looking at them, we get more of a sense of, is it likely we'll be able to do something? No, it isn't. So how do we begin to plan to trans, to, to change that event and transfer it to an online event? Mm -hmm. One of the large things, especially for um, Pima County is sporting events and large scale sporting events with spectators and kids and um, participants, but I, I found a, a, an online um, conversation that Dr. Fauci did, and people were asking, when will we be able to do large-scale events? And really, he said, it's unlikely right now that you're going to see a host full capacity crowd during 2021. Um, will there be less capacity, 50%, 25%, maybe? Will there be restrictions on events? There will be. Um, there are some professional leagues that are playing now, but they're, they're under very strict, tight bubbles where they're in a pod, they don't go out, they're tested every day. And even those you've seen what the NFL um, cancel. So he was saying, you know, you may look maybe in July um, NBA postseason, maybe some games, but again, he, he thought that would be cutting it close. So the return of really tight packed crowds that we all love in a big event and the excitement of what makes that happen, um, it's going to take time. So we have to be cognizant of that. We have to know we make plans and they're going to change. So just be prepared for that on large scale events. No time really right away that would that will happen as far as other events festivals and community events um, move to multiple days multiple location what can you move online what kind of other added value can you give what we're seeing is sponsors are still there businesses are still there and want to support their local community but they know it's not the time now as I said, the lack of volunteers, in some cases, the lack of staff. We've seen downsizing of staff. So everybody's in the same boat um, and we're all paddling hopefully towards the shore where when it's safe, we'll move forward. The other side of that equation is really the hesitation of the public to attend events. We get calls every day, um, is it safe? Well, the answer to that is, is it really depends on your personal, what your health status is, how comfortable you feel, um, you know, where you're coming from, what event you're going to. So when we look at it, we're really looking into second quarter or later before those return. Um, and we have a lot of conversations, as I said, with Dr. Cullen and it's a nice back and forth of they really are trying to understand what is the event? Um, how might we change the size or scope of it so we could do it? Um, we work with them on trying to understand the health implications of a larger event. And here's why it's important that they have multiple entrances and exits. And here's, here's what they have to do for safety for their event. Is that possible? So just know that those conversations are going on back and forth and it's not a, they don't understand our business um, and we don't talk to them. We do multiple times every day. 
and um, we'll, we'll get there. It's just going to take a while. So one thought I had is, and Dr. Cullen, you might have a response to this, like how does the vaccine strategy help you, you know, think through that? And is there, you know, when we get vaccines and then how long is it going to take for us to then start interacting again in the way that Diane has described? What, what is your response? Yeah, so let me give you an update on vaccines. The one thing I want to say before I do that, though, is that, and Diane knows this because I say it a lot, our goal is to get to yes. Our goal is to keep stuff open. Our goal is to ensure that we have a vibrant economy and business community in Pima County and, and Tucson. Right now, we have this overwhelming pandemic, and so what we need to do is ensure we stay safe and healthy to get out the other side. And Barbara, the thing that's going to get us out the other side is the vaccine, mm -hmm. to be frank. Um, and so I am optimistic. Actually, I'm, I'm not optimistic about everything, but I'm optimistic about the vaccine. December 15th, we will have vaccine in this community. It will be for healthcare workers. It will be distributed through TMC and UMC, not just for TMC and UMC employees, but they are what we're doing, the pods. And we call the vaccine pizza boxes, kind of a weird name. Um, I haven't seen a pizza box in person, but it's a big box and it has um, a little less than a thousand vaccines in it. We have six of them coming to UMC, six of them coming to TMC. Um, we have indications from the state that we then have accelerated delivery of vaccine uh, through this month. And as you know, vaccine is prioritized and it's prioritized to healthcare workers and long-term care slash assisted living. Long-term care assisted living is really due to the incredible mortality, the death rate that has occurred in those communities because we would like to stop that if we can. And despite all our other mechanisms, we still see death, increased deaths in those communities. Then people get prioritized, 1A, 1B, 1C, 2, 3, 4. Uh, dependent upon accessibility to the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine is what we believe we'll get first, then Moderna comes. The Pfizer is the really cold one. Moderna doesn't need as much cold. Um, we will have, we, we do have uh, a vaccination strategy for the county dependent on the amount of vaccine we have available. We do hope that by the end of second quarter, we ha will have done at least most of the people that need to be immunized. Now, don't hold me to that because I'm not the one deciding how much vaccine we're getting and who's making it. Um, but by the fall, for sure, we should be okay. Now, the question comes up, pretty regularly. How many people need to be immunized or what kind of herd immunity do you need to have before you see that if somebody doesn't have a vaccination uh, because, you know, they're a healthy 20 year old who um, would be probably in group four. Um, what we believe is that's around 70 to 75 percent. We have seen with other vaccines, I actually ran a hepatitis A um, epidemic. This is now about 15 years ago, and we were able to stop that within a month, but I don't think that's what's going to happen here. I think we're going to need to see pretty significant immunization throughout the community before we get there. But the good news, the immunizations are there. We obviously we have a de dependency on FDA giving us an emergency use authorization, February, I mean, December 10th and December 17th, the important day is when they're going to meet and make decisions about uh, Pfizer and then Moderna. Um, the county is working closely with the state, the city, the hospitals, the Tonotham Nation, the Pascoyaki tribe, and other areas to make sure that we get immunization out there. We are sensitive to uh, populations that have suffered disparity, and we are working closely to ensure that vulnerable populations get it. But Barbara, the good news is that there there is, there, there is this hope That's the that is out there. And, and so I, I, to go back to how I started, which didn't sound very hopeful, right? Like everything's red, what could possibly be good um, is if we can get through this period with 
a healthy community at the end of it, we will be doing those things Diane talked about. People right. will be back, you know, at Mikhail watching basketball games. It's right. going to happen. Um, but it's just taken us a while to get there. In the last two minutes, then, of course, there's the gym show question. So just quickly, I know some of the major shows canceled, but is there still any gym show activity uh, that will happen? Diane, can you answer that one? Uh, I, I can briefly, and then I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Cullen. Um, nobody wants the gym show to happen more than we do. We know what it means to this community. We know the economic impact of the gym show, but again, there are two sides to this. Can, can it be safe? And also recognize the, e the economic impact to those that are, are hosting a gym show. Where are their dealers coming in? Can they come in? Are they quarantined? They can't get their stock in. I mean, we answer questions every day and, and I'll let Dr. Colin take it, but I think it's gonna be very difficult to do large scale uh, gym shows and she spent a lot of time and effort and a lot of calls trust me working with the vendors trying to find a way to say yes right. but at some point for the safety of the community some of them just said economically what you want me to do I can't do and so that decision was made but Dr. Colin you might yeah, no, I, I, Diane, thanks for coloring it that way because it's really true. We really have worked with a lot of vendors. We've actually learned a lot and um, the vendors have been incredibly wonderful and cooperative. And when I say something, I can see their, their face go, oh my goodness, but let me see if I can do that. Uh, and we've been in this dialogue for about two months. The problem is right now where we are. So if we were had 250 cases a week right now, I think our recommendations would end up being different. So we have, um, in the last few months, we look at anything over 50 people and we've done lots of approvals. What you need to know is some of those approvals we just pulled because we said we approved you safely five weeks ago, it is not safe now, we cannot do this. So the gem show right now, the, the real caveat here is it's fast approaching. And if you remember what I said earlier, I don't think we get out of this for four, six, eight weeks. Um, that's right in the middle of the gem show. So we are still doing, Barbara, we're still doing reviews of some of the shows and actually some of the shows that are very, very small will probably move along with, um, with approvals uh, that I won't have to pull. But uh, right now, anything that's big, we are giving uh, a very cautious, we don't think we can do this safely. I understand and I appreciate the updates that you gave today and the advice uh, and the caution and so I hope that we can heed that so we can stay healthy. I know there were a lot of questions but I know some were answered. Um, the Pima Eats, I didn't know if there was a link to Pima Eats but if there is um, you can put that in the chat um, and what we'll do because we're staying on time we'll close today but just please visit Connect Tucson to look for all the resources. There are uh, grant funds that were approved recently, uh, another uh, tranche of funds uh, for uh, small business. So the YWCA is administering those funds and they have application links on the site, but you can find all the links to that by going to connecttucson.com. So again, thank you, Diane. Thank you, Dr. Cullen. I appreciate uh, the time you spent with us today. We're going to be back next week, Monday at 3 p.m. We'll do something a little different. We'll hold our session in a meeting format so that we can all share in a dialogue. We're going to reflect on what we've learned this year and what we hope to see in 2021. Be sure to register when you see the email invite in your inbox. It is our goal to keep you connected during this pandemic. So mask up, stay well, and don't forget you can call our small business hotline at 520-837-4100. And I think with that, I will say good afternoon. So thank you again.